appreciate it. And, and thank you to all of you for, for dropping by. I know this is a busy time of year right before the holidays. So I, I do appreciate it. And I hope you, hope you get something out of the seminar. Um, I'm Mike Andrews and this is, this is Bar Talk. So this paper really is, is motivated by a simple question, but, but I hope it's a question that you'll agree is interesting and important. Um, what I wanna think about here is just how important are social interactions for innovation broadly and, and a little bit more specifically for invention. And uh, in this paper, I, I wanna think about a specific kind of social interactions. I wanna think about trying to quantify the importance of informal social interactions. Um, and when I think about sort of what motivates this project, I go back to some of the most fundamental things we know about the innovation process. So in particular, we know that uh, most innovation tends to happen in cities where there are a lot of people. Um, and in fact, we know more than that. We know that, that there are increasing returns to population in terms of innovation. So each person is more innovative when there are more other people around them. And one of our explanations for this is knowledge spillovers, right? When people can bump into one another more easily and swap ideas, take an idea out of my head and, and give it to somebody else, that's where we expect to see innovation happen more often. That jives really well with a lot of our theories about how the innovative process works. Think about our, our theories of innovative search or recombination of ideas, things like that. And, and the empirical upshot of this is if we believe in these stories about knowledge spillovers, we should be able to manipulate how people interact and then see changes in terms of innovative output. And I think this is a really, really exciting time to be studying innovation because it's only been in the last few years that we have, I think, the theoretical understanding and the data and the empirical tools to actually test these ideas, to actually manipulate how people interact and, and study these and, and find the outcome. And this is one of the things actually that I think this seminar series has been fantastic for. So, you know, think back a few weeks ago, Keith Pennington gave a fascinating paper about uh, what happens to firm innovation during flu season when people, you know, come into work less often uh, and we change really how people interact in the workplace. I see this paper as a little bit different because Again, I'm thinking about informal social interactions. So instead of thinking about interactions in the workplace, I wanna think about what happens when we change the way people interact when they are um, outside of the workplace, when they're off the clock, when they're talking to people who maybe are, are not even their coworkers. So let me just give you an example, first of all, to fix ideas, and then I'll get into specifically what I'm looking at here in this paper. So this is the, the Oasis Bar and Grill uh, right off the Stanford University campus in Menlo Park, California. Uh, actually, the Oasis closed its doors for the last time uh, about a year and a half ago. So a victim not of COVID, but of the exorbitant real estate prices in, in the Bay Area. Um, the Oasis is a, a pretty famous bar and grill as far as bars and grills go. Uh, it was really the, the home away from home of the homebrew computer club, which I think it's, it's not an exaggeration to say, launched the PC industry as we know it today. So. Uh, the Homebrew Computer Club counted people like Steve Wozniak as its members. And how the Homebrew Computer Club really worked is they would meet on the Stanford University campus, have something like a, a formal seminar, uh, go out to the parking lot and swap computer parts, and then they would go over to the Oasis and the conversation would continue there. But if you think about the interactions that take place sort of in the formal setting on Stanford versus in the informal setting at the, the bar, you know, at the Oasis, there's nobody setting an agenda. Um, there's nobody taking role. You can come in, talk to whoever you want, so you just mingle. So you think about the, the types of interactions that are happening, the type of talking that's happening. Uh, it's very different between in the formal setting and the informal setting. And you might think that these different types of interactions uh, might be complementary, but, but at the very least might play different roles in the innovative process. So sort of the thought experiment I want you to have in the back of your head today is what would we expect to see happen if we basically shut down the kinds of conversations that could have happened at, at the Oasis. So that's, I'll be looking at a different time period in a different place, but that's the idea I want you to have in the back of your head. Um, now, I, I think it's worth taking just a minute or two to talk about why it's so difficult, I think, to, to study the importance of informal interactions in particular, right? So, First of all, I think just these kinds of conversations, right, the, the bar talk that happens at the bar, these things are difficult to observe. 
right? It, it's not the kinds of conversations that we can maybe proxy by, by looking at employment relationships or something like that. Um, so that, that's something we need to think about. There's also a fundamental endogeneity challenge here, right? People are choosing who they talk to, who they interact with. So, you know, I, maybe I see that a lot of the people who went to the Oasis Bar and Grill also made important innovations in the PC industry. I, of course, don't want to conclude that going to the Oasis is what caused them to come up with those ideas. So I need to think of some way to, to overcome this endogeneity challenge. And this third point here is something that I think those of us who stare at patent data day in and day out sometimes, uh, you know, take for granted or overlook. And that's just the fact that innovation is actually quite a rare phenomenon in the population. So if that's true, um, there's really two things we can do. First of all, we can either study a group that's at a very high risk of innovating. That's what we see in a lot of these papers that look at you know, what happens when we change the uh, location of scientists' offices or, or you know, the death of a scientist in a social network. Uh, we're looking at a group that is, is highly likely to be innovative. If we wanna think about innovation in the broader population, we're gonna need a really large sort of um, intervention in terms of social interactions in, able to, in order to see anything sort of on the outcome side, right? Either a very large intervention or, and hopefully also an intervention that lasts for a substantial period of time. So that's what I wanna do in this paper. Uh, to address all three of these points, what I wanna do is study a massive and involuntary disruption of informal social interactions. So to do that, what I'm going to look at is alcohol prohibition, right? So uh, what I'll argue actually is that as important as the bar or the pub is today, and as important as places like the Oasis was in the 1970s and 1980s for pioneers in the early PC industry, if we jump back in time another five or six decades or so, prior to uh, the passage of, of prohibition laws in the US, turns out the, the bar or, or the saloon uh, was even more important as a really a social hub, as a place for people to get together and interact. Uh, the saloon was a place where a substantial portion of the population spent a substantial portion of their leisure time. So with alcohol prohibition, basically the state came in and caused a massive change in the way people lived their social lives. Basically overnight came in and told people they had to find other places and other ways in which to interact. So the idea with this paper here is I'm going to observe how invention changes, first of all, as this informal social network that was meeting at the bar uh, gets shut down. And then over time, because these laws last for several years, I can see what happens as individuals rebuild these informal social networks. And a little more specifically, especially for those of you um, maybe who are less familiar with some aspects of US history, uh, I think a lot of us are familiar with the passage of federal prohibition, which went into effect in 1920 through 1932. But prior to this, what's very nice for this study, is there's a large number of states passed statewide prohibition laws. So I've got geographic and temporal variation in terms of where these laws are going into effect. And what's even nicer is that prior to state laws, counties in the US could decide for themselves whether to allow the saloon or not. So with the passage of state laws, counties are going to be differentially treated on the basis of their local prohibition laws. So this is, this is what I'm gonna exploit, uh, the variation I'm gonna exploit in the empirical study, okay? Um, I see, there might be a question in the chat. I'm not gonna be monitoring that, so I'll just take those at, at the end. Um, no, it's okay. Don't, don't worry about it. If there is some clarification question, I will interrupt you, okay? Sounds good, please feel free to. Uh, okay, so let me just give you a quick preview of the results then and the, the likely chance that I'm scrambling to get through at the end. Um, what I find is that imposing statewide alcohol prohibition laws or really laws that shut down the saloon causes a drop in patenting by about 12 to 15% per year. Now this, this is a large effect, I think, a sizable effect. And again, one of the nice things here is because these laws are in place for a while, I can study the dynamics. So what I see is that this drop is gonna be largest in the years immediately following the imposition of prohibition laws. And then it's gonna largely rebound within about uh, three to five years. And this is, I think, exactly what we should expect to see if we realize that you know, people are, are going to uh, adapt and respond to this prohibition law and rebuild their social networks over time. Um, I'll spend some time in the paper, uh, in the talk today, and I'll spend much more time in page space actually in the paper. 
uh, arguing that this, this effect, this 12 to 15% drop that we see, appears to be driven by a disruption of informal social interactions rather than you know, other stories you could maybe tell about why patenting might drop after prohibition. And then what I think is really interesting is I can use uh, the imposition of prohibition laws to think about and draw some conclusions about why informal social interactions might be important for innovation uh, and, and how these informal social networks form over time. And sort of the, the takeaway from all of this, and I'll, I'll explain exactly how I measure these things as I, as I go through, but the takeaway from all this is that disrupting the ways in which individuals informally interact is going to have a large, 12 to 15%, large, but relatively short-lived effect on the rate of inventive activity. But it's going to have a persistent effect on the structure of these informal social networks, and that's going to manifest itself in a persistent effect on the direction of inventive activity. And again, I'll explain these in more detail as I, as I get through uh, the results. Okay, Let me take a moment before I really get into it to argue about why the saloon was so important as a social institution um, in the decades before prohibition, right? Again, even more important as a social institution than the bar is today, by far, I would argue. So if you look at the historical pre-prohibition saloon, the saloon was really the first place travelers would stop when they got to a new town. Um, saloons would provide mailing addresses for new residents. They provided access to newspapers where you could just, you know, come in and, and read about the goings on in the world, ideally if you also bought a drink. Uh, they had the first public telephones. So if you, if you look at these first four bullet points here, when a new idea arrives into a town, whether it comes wrapped up in a person, right, a traveler or a new resident, or whether it comes in, in writing, in the mail, or, or in a newspaper, or whether a new idea comes electronically, you know, over the telephone or over a telegraph wire, it's often getting to the saloon first, right? Saloons often have the only public washroom. So if anybody on here has ever had an office next to the, the department bathroom, uh, you sort of know what kind of foot traffic that generates and the kinds of conversations and uh, um, swappings of, of ideas that that, that, can, that can cause. And finally, and, and maybe most importantly, you know, this idea of a, the, the happy hour where people get together and uh, meet up at the bar around work hours, that's not a recent invention. Um, and one final point I should make, especially related to this last one here, uh, <clears throat> exactly the kinds of people who are attending these, these happy hours, um, really spending a lot of time in saloon, are exactly the kinds of people who are most likely to be inventors in this time period, so the first few decades of the 20th century. Um, I've done some prior work with, with Sharda and, and at Wisconsin Business School and Nick Zebarth at Auburn looking at uh, identities of inventors. And one of the things we find is that during this time period, most inventors are not scientists or engineers like they might be today. They're instead what I would call skilled craftsmen or, or skilled blue collar workers, people like mechanics and engineers, exactly the kinds of people we expect to find in the pre-prohibition saloon. In fact, you can even look at the names of, of a lot of these historical saloons. They have names like the Mechanics Exchange, things like that, where all the mechanics in town would get together, exchange ideas, uh, even if they worked at other firms. So they're sort of generating that cross-firm uh, knowledge flow, okay? So saloon was a very important social institution. Um, I wanna argue that this idea that the, the saloon itself was important for facilitating the transfer of ideas, this is not just something I cooked up. This is something that was actually recognized by contemporaries at the time. So this is a, a quote from uh, author whose name is E.C. Moore. I think this is actually volume three, I believe, of the American Journal of Sociology. So from 1897, um, Moore writes, the social stimulus is epitomized in the saloon. It's the center of learning, books, papers, and lecture hall. And we shouldn't look down on the saloon as an educational institution just because there aren't skilled teachers or professors there, because the people are teaching themselves by through their interaction. Okay. Um, this is a quote from, from Jack London, who, as some of you may know, Jack London had kind of a, a complicated relationship with the bottle. Um, this is actually from Jack London's 1913 novel, John Barleycorn. Uh, Jack London writes, always when men came together to exchange ideas, they did so over alcohol. The saloon was the place of congregation. Men gathered to it as primitive men gathered about the fire. Okay. 
And this final quote, this is one I actually like a lot. This is from British author G.K. Chesterton. He's just done a, a tour of the U.S. And Chesterton here is writing in 1922. So this is after the U.S. passes a federal prohibition amendment. So the, the legal saloons are shut down all across the country. And there's a lot of writing at the time that said it, it shouldn't really matter if the, the bars all get shut down. Because at this time, we, we have the emergence of a new institution that people can go to for entertainment and diversion, the early movie theater, okay? So Chesterton writes that the cinema boasts of being a substitute for the tavern, but I think it's a very poor substitute. Nobody enjoys cinemas more than I do, but to enjoy them, a man has only to look and not even to listen, and in a tavern, he has to talk. And I think this is really underscoring and driving home this idea that at the, at the bar, there's, this conversation is really important and there really is idea flow between individuals and you can see how that might, that might be beneficial for innovation, okay? So then the question of course is what happens when the bars get shut down? So let me give you a, a very brief one slide history of prohibition in the US. Um, this is a picture, a uh, fairly famous picture of Carrie Nation who actually was famous for going around in uh, Kansas and, and Texas uh, and literally uh, smashing up saloons with her hatchet. Uh, actually, exactly during the time period we'll be studying here, the, the first few decades of the 20th century, um, the 10, 15 years or so before the federal prohibition amendment goes into effect. So throughout most of US history, um, before prohibition, there's a doctrine known as the local option, which exactly as the name implies, means that counties, can determine their own alcohol rules, right? Can determine whether to allow the saloon or not. Uh, beginning in the late 19th century and really picking up steam in the first few decades of the 20th century, uh, the, the movement really first grows and becomes statewide and then eventually becomes national. So beginning in the late 19th century, states begin passing statewide alcohol prohibition laws or, or saloon prohibition laws really is more accurate. And the idea is when these statewide laws go into effect, they shut down the, the saloons in a state. If you're a county that's already imposed prohibition at the county level, a statewide law is not gonna have much of an effect because the saloons have already been closed. So counties are going to be differentially affected by statewide prohibition laws, depending on their local option regime. And then, you know, finally, this movement is gonna continue to grow um, and is gonna culminate in the passage of federal prohibition around 1920. Actually, I put a little asterisk here um, we know when the federal prohibition amendment goes into effect, but really the, the U.S. had de facto prohibition during 1917. Uh, so we just need to think a little bit about what we think the real start date of federal prohibition is. Um, the only upshot here is the results I'll show you are going to be robust to excluding everything that happens starting in 1917 with the U.S. entry into World War I. Okay. So for this study to work, there's really three pieces of data that I need. Um, first of all, I need some information on statewide prohibition laws. Uh, you can get these from many sources, but found a 2008 paper by, by Lewis to be extremely helpful. Also some more contemporary data by MERS. Uh, the real thing that you need is, is not just information about these statewide prohibition laws, but some information about county level prohibition status in each year, right? Because for every county, I need to know whether this county was already wet or dry prior to the passage of the statewide law. So this information comes from a great data set put together by, by Seacrest, uh, which itself is built from consulting hundreds and hundreds of newspaper reports, uh, figuring out whether a, a given county is reported to be wet or dry in any given year. Now, I, I think there's one concern about this data that's worth mentioning. And that's that the passage of these state prohibition laws doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? There's, there's some underlying changes in social and cultural views that are driving places to decide to adopt prohibition, right? It's probably, uh, you know, an increase in, in religious and social conservatism. You can think about mapping this to ideas about um, social tightness. Uh, and, and the idea is that the same changes that are happening at the state level to bring about the passage of state laws are probably happening at the county level too. So I wanna make sure what I'm picking up is not counties that are changing their view towards alcohol over time, Right? Of course, you know, views towards alcohol, these underlying social views might also be correlated with, with innovation. We know socially tight places innovate less as well. So what I want is, is to find a, a set of counties where I believe their, their social and cultural views have been relatively constant. And the only change really is what happens to the state law. So to do this, what I'm gonna do is use only the counties that were consistently wet 
or consistently dry for several years prior to the passage of the state prohibition law, right? If I see a county that's changing its local prohibition laws, that's probably a county where the underlying cultural views are changing. And I, I can also go a step further and actually in my baseline sample, I'm going to restrict my attention only to counties that pass statewide prohibition laws in a state referendum. And then I can see how individual counties voted. So what I'm gonna do in my baseline sample is look at counties that were consistently wet and voted to stay wet in a statewide referendum, compare these to counties that were consistently dry and voted to stay dry before and after the passage of the state prohibition law. So that's gonna be the diff and diff here. Okay, um, whoops. Yeah, this is, uh, this is where the data comes from. So there's relatively few states here because again, I'm restricting attention to states that passed pro statewide prohibition laws by referendum. Uh, the blue counties here are going to be counties that um, voted, that were consistently wet and voted to stay wet. The parched brownish tan are gonna be counties that were dry, voted to stay dry. Um, the missing data is from, first of all, these are states that didn't pass prohibition laws or didn't pass prohibition laws by referendum. Um, inside these states where I have some data, uh, the missing counties on here are either going to be cases where Seacrest has missing data, or far more likely, these are counties that were changing their, their local laws. So again, I, I want to throw out the cases where the underlying cultural views towards alcohol are changing substantially over time. Okay. Um, Oh, sorry. Somehow when it's my backup slides. There we go. Okay. The, the final piece of data that I need in this project is, of course, something on the outcome side, something about innovation. Um, I'll be looking at patent data for this. Um, I think most of us are familiar with modern patent data. Um, historical patent data is uh, harder to use in, in the sense that it wasn't collected digitally by the, the patent office until 1976 but several groups have been putting together fantastic historical patent data sets. Um, here, I'm gonna use as the baseline, the HistPat data set by Sergio Petralia and co-authors. Uh, the key things I need here are, when is the patent from, the location of the inventors, and then also to think about collaboration patterns and stuff, it's gonna be helpful to have inventor names. Um, I'm gonna merge this with the, the Comprehensive Universe of US Patents, the CUSP put together by Enrico Burkis, uh, contains additional information on patents. This is just a fantastic data set um, for modern patents as well as historical patents. So anyone that wants to look at long-term trends in patenting that sort of straddles the 1976 barrier, I, I strongly recommend the CUSP put together by Enrico, um, as well as pull in additional information from the USPTO. Okay. So this is, this is just the raw data. Um, I, I just wanna see what happens in patenting in the counties that were wet prior to state prohibition laws, what happens in the counties that were consistently dry. And what you can see here, hopefully it's obvious just from looking at the raw data, you know, it looks like these are, are reasonably parallel and I'll, I'll show you the dynamic dip and diff in a couple of slides. Prior to the passage of the statewide prohibition law, that's year zero. And then it looks like something changes. And in particular, it looks like we see a drop in these formerly wet counties, not much in these formerly dry counties, and maybe in this last year, like they both drop and that'll partial out the difference out in the diff and diff. Um, but just looking at the raw data, I think it all already looks like something is going on uh, in these wet counties relative to the dry counties. So this is, this is what I'll estimate. It's fairly standard diff and diff. I just wanna see, what happens to patenting in the wet counties relative to the dry counties, at least the counties that were wet before the prohibition law, after the prohibition law goes into effect. Um, I can include county and year fixed effects. I'll also include a set of time varying county specific controls, although all the results are going to be uh, insensitive to whether I include, excuse me, include these or not. So what do I find? Uh, these are our baseline results. Uh, so looking at, at logged patenting, I find that Patenting is going to drop by about 12%, like 12% fewer patents per year in these wet counties relative to the dry counties after the statewide prohibition law goes into effect. So this is where this 12% number I mentioned in the introduction comes from. We can also think about patenting rates, right? So I can look at patents per capita or, or patents per 100,000 capita here, uh, drops by about 0.4 patents per 100,000 capita in the wet counties relative to the dry counties 
after the prohibition law goes into effect. Uh, if we look at the mean of the dependent variable here, this ends up being about a 15% decline. So this is where the, the 12 to 15% number comes from. So I think, uh, you know, relative to my prior, this is quite a sizable drop in patenting after these prohibition laws go into effect. And again, one of the really nice things here is that these prohibition laws last for a while, a substantial period of time. So this allows me to actually investigate the dynamics. So this is the dynamic diff and diff. Uh, it's just the specification from the previous page, but instead of just having that post on me, I can look at different, you know, different year bins. So what you can see is prior to the passage of a statewide prohibition law, um, the trends are parallel, right? There's no difference between the, uh, the wet and the dry counties after taking out the county fixed effects. Uh, this is gonna be our omitted category. And then we see a large drop in the first two years that these laws are in effect, slightly smaller drop two years after that. And so we get to years four and five, I can no longer reject that there's any difference between the wet and dry counties. So we see evidence of a drop and then something that looks like a pretty clear recovery after a few years. And again, I argue that this is exactly what we should expect to see if we think people are rebuilding these social networks over time. Okay, uh, this is robust to a lot of things. Again, I can throw out, worry about World War I, I can throw that out. It's not driven by a few large counties. Um, one thing I quite like is you can look at placebo prohibition laws, which are prohibition laws that were um, put up to a vote, but then fail. So those are cases where we think we have the same sort of underlying changes in, in cultural views, but they don't actually shut down the bar. And in those cases, we see no effect. Um, robust to a number of alternative specifications as well, the different ways of transforming the dependent variable, um, things like that. Okay. So um, why should we think that these results are actually being driven by the disruption of social interactions instead of some other stories? Um, here, I'm gonna run through these quite quickly. So I apologize for that, but let me, let me just sketch out a few results for you. First of all, um, I, I can look at how uh, patenting changes when the authors on a patent, the inventors on a patent, when there's first of all, a collaboration going on when there's more than one inventor and when these inventors live different distances apart, okay? So first of all, when, when two inventors on a patent live in the same county, I see a pretty sizable drop in patenting there. But when inventors are living in different towns, different counties or different states, I see basically no effect of prohibition. So this is consistent with this being a social interaction story, right? Closing down the, the saloons makes it harder for me to interact with people close to me, but doesn't really make it any more difficult for me to collaborate with somebody living across the country. Um, second thing I, I'll show you very quickly is just that patenting is going to decline most for the people who are most directly affected by the closing of the saloons. What, what do I mean by that? The, the groups who we think are most likely to be frequenting the saloons prior to prohibition are also the groups for whom we see a biggest drop in patenting. And I think the easiest way to think about this is uh, looking at men versus women. So prior to prohibition, uh, the saloon basically was the domain of men. Women were, were basically not welcome. We can see this is just looking within the wet counties, right? So just in these places that are treated by prohibition, um, we see basically parallel trends. And then we see a sharp drop in patenting by men. And then something that looks like our rebound, basically nothing for women. Um, we can also do this in basically the triple diff. So this is looking at how the, the gender gap in patenting changes between men and women uh, in the wet counties, the black line, and the dry counties and the, the gray line. And again, it looks like the gender gap gets smaller in the dry counties, not as much movement in, uh, excuse me, gender gap shrinks in the, the wet counties, not as much movement in the dry counties, um, exactly as we'd expect to see. I should mention, by the way, female patenting is quite rare in this period, but it's not trivial. So it's something like 7% of all patents. Um, so small, but, but not nothing. Uh, you can do similar results, a little bit noisier looking at ethnicity. So there's some ethnic groups that we know are more likely to frequent the saloon than others, and we see similar kind of results. Um, you can also rule out a number of other stories. So there's no evidence that there's, for instance, a general economic downturn following prohibition. This is not being driven by a drop in alcohol-related patenting. Um, doesn't appear to be explained by, say, differential outmigration from wet counties after prohibition goes into effect. Um, one question people ask a lot is, is whether this is actually a story about social interactions or whether this is changes in alcohol consumption itself, right? Like there's this debate in the creativity and pharmacology literature about whether alcohol actually makes us 
more creative. Um, this is, of course, something that's difficult to measure because you know we don't have great measures of how much people are drinking, uh, especially not during prohibition when the saloon is illegal. But there's some pretty clever proxies out there. So Jeff Mirren and co-authors, for instance, have looked at um, cirrhosis rates of the liver. You can also look at uh, variation across types of prohibition laws. So um, every prohibition law is going to shut down the saloons, but some are going to go a step further and actually make it illegal to um, sell, transport, um, you know, uh, even consume alcohol in some cases. Those are bone dry laws. And if we thought this was a story about alcohol consumption, we should see expect to see bigger drops in patenting in places with the stricter prohibition laws. We see no difference. And we see no difference when you control for cirrhosis rates and things like that. So it doesn't look like this is being driven by changes in alcohol consumption. Again, I think leading some, some credence to this idea that it really is a social interaction story. And finally, these dynamics that we can look at, I think are very helpful. Um, and the dynamics are not consistent with a number of other stories we might want to tell. For instance, you might think that, you know, we know that invention and, and crime are negatively correlated. You might think that this is being driven, this drop is being driven by the rise of organized crime during prohibition. You know, that's something that gets stronger over time. Instead, we see a sharp drop right away and then a rebound. So it is not really consistent with a lot of these alternative stories. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to think about in the, the five minutes or so I have remaining is thinking about, you know, we see patenting drop and then it largely recovers within a few years. As people react to these prohibition laws and start to rebuild their, their informal social networks, we know they can't go and talk at the bar anymore, at least not the legal bar. But as they rebuild these social networks, are they interacting with the same old people, but in new places? Like instead of meeting up at the bar, maybe I see my same old friends at you know the church picnic or the barber shop, the bowling alley, maybe the speakeasy. Or when I go to these new places, am I actually meeting up with new people and potentially being exposed to new ideas? So I think you can see why this is an important question. It, it matters in terms of thinking about um, how the ideas we create depend on the, the social venues in which we interact. So, um, how I'm going to think about that, this, first of all, we, we want to know what happens to the social network, um, first of all, right away, right after people are affected by the shock, but then we want to know what happens to these social networks over time as people recover. So to think about this, what I'm going to do is look at these diff and diff results again, but this, uh, the, the post period, I'm going to break up into two periods. I'm going to look at the first three years after prohibition and then the next three years. So this is just repeating our, our baseline results. Um, so these are numbers that shouldn't surprise you based on the, the pictures I've already shown you. This is just sort of so we can compare some other results to our baseline. We see a large drop in the first three years, but then I can't reject that there's full recovery after about three years or so, okay? So this is overall patenting. What I wanna think about now is who's collaborating with whom, right? Who, who is in your social network? So next, what I wanna look at are the number of patents coming from inventors who have collaborated together prior to the sample period. And I want to see how much that drops after prohibition, but then I also want to see if that recovers. So that's what I'm going to look at in columns two. And uh, let me start with column two, actually. This is, uh, again, the number of patents where the inventors on the patent have collaborated together prior to the sample period. I see a sharp drop immediately after prohibition. But while overall patenting is going to recover, you can see that right here, um, patenting by people who have worked together before never recovers, at least not the, during the sample period that I look at. Um, I, I never see any evidence that there's a strong recovery in the wet counties relative to the dry counties. So I, I see this as, as some evidence that you're actually interacting and collaborating with new people after the prohibition law goes into effect, and that this effect is persistent. This isn't just an immediate reaction to prohibition, but even once overall patenting starts to recover, this effect on the identities of collaborators persists. You can also look at, at new collaborations, right? So these are how many patents are there where the inventors have never collaborated before. We see a, a small drop after prohibition, but then uh, basically nothing after about three years. So again, this is some evidence that uh, it's these old collaborations are dying away and not coming back, much less of an effect on new collaborations. And this effect on the identities of collaborators persists. 
the final thing I, I, I want to think about is a little bit, you know, maybe a little bit more tentative here. It's thinking about the direction of innovation. You can measure this in different ways. What I've done here, this is fairly crude, but I think a straightforward way to think about this. I look at the, the most commonly patented patent class in each county, the most commonly patented patent class prior to the prohibition period. It's a lot of Ps. Um, uh, the pre-prohibition lead patent class, how does that change? After prohibition, we see about a nine percentage point decrease in a 9% decrease in the wet counties relative to the dry counties. And this doesn't recover either. So these counties that are affected by prohibition are seeing relatively less patenting in the areas they used to patent in most often uh, relative to the, the dry counties and no evidence of recovery either. There's some other ways you can think about the direction of innovation that give us consistent results. The idea here is that um, I'm interacting with different people, this effect persists, I'm also working on different things, and this effect appears to persist as well. So I would interpret this as evidence that what you're working on depends on who you're talking to, and who you're talking to depends on where you go, where you're allowed to interact, okay? Um, there's, of course, some, some other lessons you can draw here. Um, many of these are in the paper. So uh, I see that prohibition has less of an effect when there are more substitutes for the saloon readily available. Um, can look at rookie versus serial inventors. These serial inventors, people who have uh, patented a lot previously, uh, maybe have sort of existing ways set up that they're maybe less reliant on these serendipitous interactions at, at the bar. That's exactly what we see. Um, and uh, this is an interesting result as well. I can think about whether informal and formal interactions are complements in the uh, invention production function, basically thinking about do firm patents also decline sort of telling us something about how important are those conversations in the bar for the invention that happens inside the firm. And, and it looks like they are indeed complements. Um, finally, um, nearing the end here, I'm not gonna talk about any of these results today. Uh, and in fact, I, I don't think Christian can, re can correct me. I don't think any of these are in the paper at the moment, but you can look at other settings. And I think the imposition of these statewide prohibition laws are, is a particularly clean setting to think about estimating uh, the importance of prohibition on invention. Uh, so it's a very clean setting, but you can think about other settings too. So uh, the imposition of, of the federal prohibition uh, laws, uh, we see similar effects. It's a little bit, again, we have to make some decisions about when does the federal law start, but you know, uh, we find similar results there. Um, we also see an increase in patenting when social interactions become easier. So for instance, after the repeal of prohibition, we see an increase in patenting. Uh, the, you can look at the expansion of microbreweries today. And in fact, I have another sort of very early stage paper looking at the expansion of coffee shops is with Chelsea Lensing at, at Coe College, uh, using actually distance from, from Seattle as an instrument for, for the number of Starbucks stores. And you see that as, as coffee shops expand and, and Starbucks becomes more common, we see an increase in panting as well. So again, I think statewide prohibition is just a particularly clean setting. But even in these other settings, we see results that are very consistent with informal, uh, the ease of informal interaction being very important for innovative outcomes. Um, so let me let me stop here, just reiterate what I already what I already said. The imposition of these prohibition laws reduces patenting by 12 to 15 percent. The drop is largest right away, and then it largely rebounds within a few years. And it does look like this effect is being driven by disruption of, of informal interactions. Um, as individuals respond, it really looks like they're meeting with, with new people. So, so the takeaway from this is that prohibition causes a temporary but large decline in the rate of invention and a persistent shift in who you're working with and plausibly in the direction of invention as well. So thank you very much. Let me turn it over to, to Christian and I look forward to, to his comments and to, to your comments as well. Thanks a lot.